Hey everyone, so I am at Peace Valley Park right now in Eastern PA, which has fast become my favorite park. I'll just give you a little look here. Pretty long six mile path that goes around here. As you can see, I'm plugged in to charge my Jeep 4xe. And so in this video, what I wanna do is give you the top five things that I feel are important to know as a new owner of a Jeep Wrangler Rubicon 4xe. So I, a little bit backstory, I got my Jeep 4xe in October of 2021 and have been kind of learning as I go. So this list is by no means comprehensive and exhausted. In fact, I have a feeling I'm gonna be making more videos like this as I go forward. Some of the top five will be more in depth in other videos, some of which I've made and others which will be forthcoming, but um, I wanna give the important points on those and we'll get to charging, which is on the list. These are five things that I think are important to know if you're gonna be a Jeep Wrangler 4xe owner. Some of these will apply to owning regular Jeeps and some of these will be more specifically to the 4xe. It's a general video for new owners out there that I think might help you in getting accustomed to your new hybrid vehicle. Okay, so number one is going to be the Uconnect profile and satellite system that you will be a part of when you purchase your Jeep 4xe. This will be a future video to go through. What I have here is this instruction manual, and this is for like the radio and the main dash screen because it's a satellite connection. Because with this, it's more about the important factor, which is the fact that you can get into your car through the satellite connection through the app. So I will go into the app real briefly after this, but what I wanted to say first is that when you get your Jeep, and this happened with me, is that my dealer sat with me and set up my Uconnect account. Now, if they don't do that automatically, you may wanna ask them about it and do it there, or if not, you can do it yourself. It's just a matter of getting a profile on the Uconnect app and connecting your Jeep and VIN number to it, which I'll show you in the app. I wanna go into the car real quick and show you this one piece. I'll go more in depth into this in that other video that I mentioned, but as you can see above the rear view mirror, we have the assist button and the SOS button. Those are connected to the satellite system. And so if you get into an accident or you need assistance and you can't call RCA or AAA, whoever your service provider is for roadside assistance, then you can use these buttons. Now, obviously I haven't been able to use those yet. Luckily, fingers crossed that I won't have to. Um, so I don't exactly know how that works, but all I do know is that those buttons will send a signal out through the satellite system that you're connected to, that your Jeep is connected to, and it will allow for people to know where you are and know that you need help. and they will send service out. The most important thing that I wanna mention about it is, and as I mentioned, I will get to this book in a different video about the minor and, and, and entertainment factor of it. But what's vital for me, and this is the first video I will link down, is that when I was in South Dakota, the twins video, if you saw my travel videos, was a story about how I locked my keys in my car. And, you know, with these automatic keys, it's very difficult to do that. But if you have your doors closed in the Jeep, so for instance, I had my tent on the back of the Jeep, right? So the back door and, and top was open and my doors were shut and I was in and out of the tent in the car and from in the car, I locked it. Now, when I come out from the tent, and if I close those back doors with my key in the car, it will consider it locked. It's locked. The doors, even though it's open, it's locked once it's locked. And so when it's closed, it's locked. So you can go check out my story and, and see how I learned the hard way, which is why I'm making this the first one. That Uconnect will really allow you access to your vehicle if you lock the keys in the car by some freak accident. Again, it's very hard to do that, but it happens clearly. And um, you don't want to find yourself stuck. Now, I left my keys and my phone in my car. 
<laughs> and so in that video, I tell you about how I ended up finding these twins and these guys uh, were able to download the app on their phone. I was able to sign into the app. Actually, it wasn't even an app they downloaded. I was able to sign into my Uconnect account through the web browser, their web browser on their phone get in and hit the unlock button and it unlocked the car so right now i'm going to briefly show you in the app and then we'll get on to number four okay so this is the uconnect app i've already logged in but there's a login screen that you'll put your username email and your password when you sign up as i mentioned this can probably be done at the dealership when you pick up your car but if not you can do it yourself and all the information is in the booklet that they provide as you can see your car vehicle is nicely shown exactly the way you own it on the top which is a very cool interface here so this is the info from your car so right now it's saying unplugged but it just hasn't kicked in that i plugged my jeep in this is all on your vehicle okay so this is just reiterated information your odometer your total miles the gas you have right the tire pressure let's go back to remote this is the key information based on what i want to get across with my learning the hard way <laughs> you have the ability to lock and unlock your car as well as start and to cancel the start thing you also have this horns and lights so really the key information here is this unlock really comes in handy if you're in a bind you know it, this may not happen to you and hopefully it won't happen to anybody who watches this video because you'll be more aware but it did happen to me and i took that as a sign that i needed to put that on this list to make sure that you knew that this is available to you okay so now number four as you can see i've taken the charging off i've stopped charging just for this one because we're going to be working with some of the electrical components on the door and I want to just make sure that the car is off. Number four is the door attachments to the battery, as well as the seat removal, which I'm going to just link below as the second link. I made a whole video on the seat removal, so you can check that out there. I'm going to do this door connection on camera. Now, I'm not talking about taking the doors off right now. I haven't done that yet. I'm going to wait till spring to do that. And so that'll be a whole nother video. But with this is actually really important for if you need to use your hybrid battery for camping like I do, and you're going to be leaving the vehicle for a certain amount of time locked. So sometimes I travel with my cat Bengal, if you've seen her on my channel. Sometimes if I'm running into a store or I'm going to be, you know, walking on a path for a little while, I like to keep the car AC running if it's hot or keep her temperature regulated in the car. The, the key here is that the car will turn off after 30 minutes, regardless of, of like it, at 30 minutes, it will know that the key's not in the car and with the door attached, it will know the door is shut. So once you shut the door, the timer for 30 minutes starts. And at that point, it will turn off. And that's due to this connection right here. So with this connected, the car can discern or just knows when the door is shut and when it's open. What we're gonna do is we're gonna detach this. That will allow us to keep the car running past the 30 minute mark without the automatic shutdown. So essentially this is gonna be your first step in taking the doors off, right? Because that's the connection to the electric and that's what you're gonna to need to first remove before you remove the doors off the bolts. And so we're just gonna do that step because that allows for the automatic shut off 30 minute period to not factor in in the case of shutting your door and having the car running. Now, I don't advise doing this frivolously, like you don't wanna have, there's a reason that's in place, right? But there's also a reason why it's able to be taken off. And so you have to use your discernment with your car, like what you're doing with the car running, why it's running and all of that stuff. Okay, so let's take this off. Okay, so first you're gonna need to take this plastic panel off that has snaps similar to the snaps on the back seats 
to take them off. So you can check that video out, but it's those snaps right there. They pull out, and so you're gonna wanna get your hand in the back of it to kind of lift it up and then wedge it this way towards you. It's connected by this cord, so you're gonna just wanna let that stay connected and dangle that. Okay, so that reveals this mechanism here, as you can see. And don't panic, it's a lot easier than it looks. You're just gonna be dealing with this white lift and this red switch. So as you can see, it's down right now. What you're gonna wanna do to release this is pump, bump it up. That releases the block on this white connector piece here, this white switch. That allows it, as you, I'll just show you again, down, it locks it into place. Up allows, it's a little difficult to do with one hand, but it's good that it's secure. Up allows you to maneuver this. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna come down here and there's gonna be this, there's like a little lip here. I hope you can see that. Right in here, this thing, when you push this down and lift up with this, on this white switch, it comes off. So I'm gonna try and do it with one hand, but we're gonna see. So pushing down and lifting up. So you're pushing down on this and you're lifting up on this white switch, which you'll see will go all the way up. And you can hear that clicking. That's why we turn the battery off. And then this piece comes out and now your door is detached. So all you're gonna have to do, let me close this just a hair so that we can get the slack. So you're gonna need some slack on the door, but all you're gonna do is lift this loop off this hook. And now you have your piece detached. And I usually just drop it in the door. So now you can see that this is completely detached now from the battery. The car will now not automatically shut off because this isn't attached and it will basically just not compute that the door is shut or open. It won't factor in. I leave the switch up and then I do put this panel back on, but I'm gonna wanna show you how to put it back. It's the same but reverse, but it bears repeating. So the key thing to be aware of here when you do this is again, don't have the car plugged in, don't have it on, completely off. You're gonna wanna get some slack on the door to lift that loop off. And you're gonna wanna have the slider, the red slider up to have released the white switch. Then you can hit that little black tab underneath it while you lift it up. As you can see, I could do it with one hand. You're probably gonna need two at first to get the mechanism, but it's doable. Let's just put it back together so I can show you that. Okay, so real quick here, we have our plug, which I'm gonna rehook onto that hook right here. So you'll take this piece now, you'll slide it back in. As you can see, that little knob comes on this side. You're gonna wanna make sure that it snaps in both sides. You'll either hear it or this won't be able to move until it's in completely. Okay, so you get both sides in and then this just automatically pulls it tighter. That'll snap. And the final thing you gotta do, we got the light on, so now it's connected. The final thing you gotta do is just put this down to lock in this point. So now this can't be detached. And you just take your panel, line those snaps up, snap it in and your door is reattached. I only unplug it in moments when I know I need it unplugged. I don't leave it unplugged. I keep it plugged in the majority of the time. It's only when I go camping or when I know I have to go into a store or something and I have bangle in the car that I unhook that. And I do it one, you know, I unhook it for the moment I need it unhooked. And then right when I don't need it unhooked, I hook it back in. That's just my safety precaution with it. I feel like I want to make sure that that is attached when it needs to be and only detached when I absolutely need it. Make sure that that white uh, handle is down completely. It will snap and it won't go down unless both of those pegs on either side of the female uh, or of the male part of the plug are in completely. It will drag it up with, with the slider and then you want to make sure that that red switch is down locking it into place before you cover it up so that's number four 
Okay, so now I am replugged in and charging, and now tip number three is gonna be about your wheel tire pressure and off-roading, more specifically in sand in this video. Okay, so as you can tell, I still have remnants of the beach in my car, so I do ride on the sand, but let me tell you, it was no picnic the first couple times. In fact, I will link the video of the sand trap video down below when I got stuck in the sand in the Mojave Desert out west. I had to learn, again, the hard way with this, but it's knowledge that is invaluable to me at this point and so now i know and i'm gonna pass that along to you so the key to this is to maximize your surface area of the wheel to go from digging the sand to gliding on the sand so i'm sure most of you already know how to fill your tires with air right we got these little things here it's gonna depend on the wheel type you have and I would consult your manual about what pressure your wheels need the air to be in normally. One way to easily do that, and I want to show you that now, is use your car, your dashboard. It's going to tell you exactly how much it needs. I think you saw briefly in number five on the Uconnect app, it shows you the tire pressure, but that's from the system the car system clearly so i want to show you that real briefly on the dash okay so on the dashboard here if i use my menu key and i'll make another video about this menu system and and your interface but we're talking about the wheels so if i go down we're going to get vehicle info the tire pressure the psi we have 37s and 36s so my car had red numbers when i was at 30 to 33 and it said on the bottom 35 or i'm sorry it said 37 so i'm trying to see if i can show that but it's in the right you know it's it, the psi is right right now and so you're not going to get the red numbers however when they're wrong these will turn red and the wheels will turn red the little outlines on these wheels and you'll get individual numbers for each wheel and it will tell you the pressure and if you need to put more in so right now Again, as I mentioned, I have 36, 37, I think 35 to 37 is probably okay. Your Jeep will tell you exactly what it needs to be. Okay, and, and it will vary one degree plus or minus will be fine. It will accept that and it will be okay. That's what your vehicle is gonna have in it or should have in it when you're on the road and driving normally. So I'm not actually gonna take the air out to show you. You'll be able to see that for yourself and I'm not nearby to anything that I can refill them at. And so it's just a hassle for me, but so you're, wanna, you're gonna wanna use a tire pressure gauge to gauge if you don't have, if you're not at a gas station or at a, an air pump, you know, at some facility that has it on there itself that will automatically stop when you get to a certain pressure. You're gonna wanna use a tire gauge to do that if you're off-roading or you're in kind of the middle of nowhere. I know a place I went to across the street, they had air pumps, but it really required a tire gauge to understand how much PSI was in there exactly. There also comes usually with it a, a mechanism to be able to release the air. I did use once a screwdriver. I just put the hole, you know, poked it in the hole. Probably not ideal, but it worked just fine. So you're gonna wanna get the right tools to do it appropriately. This is about sand driving and, or sand, sand driving and beach driving. And so for that, you're gonna want to have your tires at 16 to 20 PSI would be probably ideal for sand driving. It's gonna depend on the consistency of the sand and whether it's really dense sand or if it's light and fluffy, if you're on a sand dune, you know, but you should be good either way in a 16 to 20 range. I ended up doing mine to 20 and it was just enough to get me out of the hole I was spinning in. So it really is a matter of getting your wheels flat enough that the surface area has a chance for your tire treads to grab onto it and and spread out that pressure. Otherwise, if you got full tires with the 37 PSI, you're just gonna be digging the hole because it can't get the traction. So I had actually dug the hole and 
then released the air from the tires and got the 20 and it, you know, a little bit of back and forth to get out of the ditch, but kind of coasted right out. So it makes all the difference in the world and will really help in driving on the beach. You're gonna wanna use your four wheel high. Once you flatten the tire enough to get that traction, it will be less important how much or how little you press the pedal. It's vital if you have too much air in your tire because like I said, it will begin to dig and that's when the issue comes in. But once you kind of have it more flat, you sort of have like a bigger square, whereas the tire is kind of thin square, you get a, that wider square of surface area, you'll coast right out of it. So yeah, use your dashboard screen to gauge the PSI. It'll tell you when you're taking it out too. I mean, you don't even need to have the meter, but I think that's a nice handy tool to have if you're gonna be doing a lot of off-roading. Um, it's gonna be something that will benefit you. The other thing I wanna keep in mind is you're gonna to wanna to research all the permits that you need in different locations. So when I was in the Northwest, they had a off-roading day pass. Uh, I forget exactly what it's called, but put it in the comments if you know offhand. I can't think of it right now. But I you know, got a day pass, put it on the window, and was able to go wherever I wanted. Then we were in um, Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. That was a more permanent license plate thing that you have to get. And we were actually supposed to be on there. It's actually only for fishing. And certain areas are only allowed with that plate. So again, lesson learned, but you're gonna need to know what you need to pay for, what you need to get to allow yourself to go on these places. Um, a lot of the roads in the Northwest and across country, they're numbered roads and they kind of say off-roading vehicles are allowed. And so you'll know based on the signage, but just research your permits. That's probably the only other important thing to know, but tires are key. So let's move on, that's number three. Okay, so number two is going to be about the windows. So when I got my vehicle, you can opt in for the $90 Gorilla Glass. So I did that, got the Gorilla Glass on the windshield and have the Gorilla Glass on the side windows as well. It's a good investment in the beginning, I believe, because it's $90 and that increase in cost is way less than the actual windows themselves. You'll find that if you have a regular Jeep and you got it without the Gorilla Glass or before that was an option and you wanna go now and install Gorilla Glass, it's gonna be way more than $90. And so there's a little bit of a pro and con to it, okay? So I would say it's probably worth getting in the beginning, again, be mostly because of the cost. And yes, because these are rugged vehicles and you're doing off-roading stuff and you're gonna want that extra impact capacity, especially on the windshield, because as I'll show you, and as you probably know already, the Jeep windshields are unlike any other car. They're very vertical. They're way more vertical than any other car. On any other car, you have a slope, right? A slight incline, and that allows for debris and, and you know, rock salt <laughs> to bounce off of it much easier. Whereas the Jeep, you're gonna get maximum impact on that. And so the Gorilla Glass is $90 extra when you get your four by E. Why not just go for it? Now, here's the negative to it. It's not impenetrable. My Gorilla Glass, windshield cracked on the side which i will show a picture of right here and it was from minor impact on the road um, i believe it was either rock salt or rock from a car but it definitely cracked the side of my windshield and it was a pain to get fixed in the sense that the warranty is questionable you have about i think a three inch max crack that you can have on it to be under the Gorilla Glass warranty, which is in and of itself a little bit crazy to have to, you know, I think it was like four inches or five inches, but it's all about taking care of it before it gets worse. And so my argument was that I was taking care of it and it wasn't, you know, it, so it wouldn't get worse and they weren't accepting it. So long story short, I went through Mopar and Jeep Wave and they ended up reimbursing me the money to fix it. However, I did go with regular glass on the windshield as a repair. And the reason that I did that was because at the time I didn't know I was getting reimbursed, number one. And so the cost of Gorilla Glass to get the windshield, just the windshield replaced is upwards of 600 to $900. It's gonna depend on where you go and what place you use and all that stuff. And I don't wanna give you an exact price, but I know mine was quoted as being almost $700 and I've seen message boards and I've seen that it can be very expensive 
to get that Gorilla Glass replaced, as well as the Easter egg on the front of the windshield, the little Jeep car, which I will also talk about a little bit more in a moment. And I will have a subsequent video about Easter eggs on a Jeep, which I'm still trying to find them all. There's some pretty cool ones. Anyway, sidebar. The regular glass ran me 398, 400, so basically 400 and it can go upwards of 500. So, you know, if you're, if, if the difference is 500 for regular glass to 600 for Gorilla Glass, if you have insurance, which I will also get into in a moment, it's going to all depend on that, right? Jeep windshields do have a tendency to break and crack, okay? And so this is my third windshield. I just got it fixed the other day. That glass, the regular glass that I got to replace it, cracked in the center from rock salt that I saw happen and it just baited my breath and saw it spider up. And so these, as you can see, I'm gonna show you this. Again, you'll probably know, but do you see the incline? It's a, it's a steep vertical compared to any other car which I don't want to get too invasive, but you could see on that car, it's much more sloped and it allows for ricocheting to lessen the impact of any kind of debris falling on it, right? Okay, so lots of cracking on the, on the Jeep windshields. In fact, when I went to get my windshield fixed this time, I went in and they told me they couldn't put the in inspection stickers back on and I said, that's fine because I already had them off because I just got it replaced a month ago. And he said, oh yeah, you have a Jeep. So I've read and I've heard that uh, windshield place replacement, glass replacement places, they replace more Jeep windshields than they replace any other windshield combined. So you're going to have to be aware of that as you move forward. So Gorilla Glass, great place to start, right? But for me, I saw it crack from uh, uh, debris and for me, it was finding a different way to handle the situation. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. What I ended up doing was I had a $500 deductible on my insurance, which if you're getting windshields, it's gonna be just below, you know, if not right at that. And so I ended up just spending a little bit more on my premium. I think it was like $100 more for the year to get a $50 deductible. So what that's gonna do is, I'm now expecting the windshield to break all the time. But because I now am paying $100 more a year, I will pay only $50 out of my pocket and they will pay the rest of the windshield, right? The deductible is what you pay. And so that's a much more cost-effective solution than having to pay $300, $400, $500 every time the windshield breaks if your insurance is deductible is low or is, is too high. So that's the route that I would go. And, and I wanted to put this as number two because it can be a very costly issue to have. And it's something I wasn't aware of as a non-Jeep owner. You know, this is the first time I've owned a Jeep, first time I've been around Jeeps. And it's quite literally a thing that the windshields are steep, you know, are, are right side up and they take impact. And, you know, I've had stuff hit it and it doesn't crack. So they are durable, but you can only get hit by so many things in so many spots, especially if you get hit in like the edges or even get some stress fractures. That you might wanna be more uh, aware of so that you can claim the insurance and really get Jeep to pay for that. But if you go through Jeep Wave, you know, and you're kind of within the realm of the warranty with the Gorilla Glass, they'll, they'll pay for, they'll reimburse you. And so you might wanna get Gorilla Glass if that's the case, but I didn't wanna get it without the assurance that they'd reimburse me. And with this happening all the time, like it's just it's just gonna be easier to do this. And who knows, again, this is the first top five video I'm making. That might change and I might change that as I go. This is just to help you based on my knowledge and, and you can find out for yourself and what's best for you. But I would really consider going through the insurance side of things to make sure that's in order so that when the window breaks, it's not even on your mind. It's not even a thing. It's gonna be a pain to get fixed all the time, but it won't be out of your pocket. And so it's just is what it is, right? The you know, the trade-off of being a Jeep owner because these cars are beautiful. So, I mean, it is what it is, but now I feel more able to curb that cost. So one other thing I wanna mention real briefly, I said it before with the Easter eggs, right? So I ended up getting the glass, whatever, you know, was easier to get, same quality, same type, same, you know, size, all that stuff. It's for the, it's the right glass just without the little Jeep logo on the corner. If that's important to you and you can wait longer, then go for it, you know, that, that's gonna be up to you. It wasn't that important to me. And so I will mention that in the Easter egg video, it is there, it's not on my car anymore, but 
but I'm still tallying those up and that'll be a, a subsequent video. So that's number two. Okay, and so number one is gonna be about the hybrid battery. I'm actually not gonna spend an exorbitant amount of time on this because I will link in the description my video all about charging your Jeep and all about the battery. What you need to know is that the Jeep 4xE has a regenerative, regenerative braking system, RBS. That allows the car to charge the battery when you're decelerating and if you'll see in that video i show you the dial that shows you when it's in the charging mode so you can actually see when it hits to the charging area of that dial and you'll know you're charging your jeep the key is though that you're going to want the max regeneration button press and i also show that in that video so check that video out that button should always be on in my opinion because you're going to get the max you can out of all of your forward momentum down hills and all that stuff. Now, the difference is that when that button's on, the Jeep will s start to stop itself just when your foot is off the ignition. So that's a little foreign for some people and, and a little awkward, but I find it to be so easy to get used to. And I see such an increase in the amount of charging I can do with that max regeneration button on. The one thing, other thing to know about the max regeneration button is although it begins to slow the vehicle and you will notice that it doesn't stop the vehicle. So you always have to press the brake to stop the vehicle. Okay. So I don't know if I mentioned that in that video, but I wanted to mention that here. So we have two types of charging, right? Right here, I am charging with the level two, 240 volt charger. And that's going to take me about two hours. We also have a level one charger that can be used and that comes with the vehicle that can be used in any wall outlet. That's 120 volts and will take you roughly 12 hours. So I show that plug in the video below. So definitely check that out. A couple other things I want to mention that I did mention in that video was the rain, the bad weather. You shouldn't be that concerned about it. The plug is actually really encased well. So unless you're holding it upright, you're going to be fine with not getting that. You know, they, they made all the necessary considerations for wet weather. So you should be good to charge in all wet, in all weather. You're gonna get 20 to 24 miles of distance on the battery from 100 to zero. So with that, that's mostly for right commuting and easy access to charge points here and there and here and there, right? For me, camping, I use it to camp with. And so that I just leave off. I, I press the e-save button in the car, which I will show you really quickly. I showed you in that video. Right there is your panel for the vehicle's hybrid battery. You're gonna wanna have that on e-save if you're gonna wanna save the battery for extended use camping or for your own personal use in your travels. Hybrid mode will use the battery and the gas interchangeably, but will use the battery before using gallons of gas. And then electric mode is it's of itself, just fully electric mode. You'll use the battery without using any gas, but hybrid mode is probably the best for regular travel. The one other thing I wanna mention in this video that I did not mention in that other video that I learned between that video and this video is that when you're charging your Jeep, it will get 200%, but even if you're on e-save mode, when you leave that charging station, it will gradually go down to 95%. That doesn't mean you're not on e-save mode. It means that the car and the battery want to go down a little bit, especially if you have the max regeneration button on, so that the regenerative braking system will allow you to be able to charge that as it goes, right? If it's 100, there's really no place for that energy to go. And so it's actually a precautionary automatic thing that happens that allows your car to have some space, to some wiggle room to be able to charge the battery as you go. So it's normal to see it go to 95%. But then if you're on the road for an extended period of time with max regeneration on, you'll see it go up to 97, 98, 99, and it will hover there, right? But it will start to pull that initial 5% and that's not a problem. It's actually quite normal for it to do that. In a subsequent video to come, I will go under the hood and show you the actual battery and what's underneath there um i'm in the process of getting that video together to make and film so i'll show you the battery at that point but that's just a little bit the information more detailed about charging is going to be in that description box so you're going to want to check that out as a full comprehensive look at number one on my list so that's my top five my current top five not the end not exhaustive there's plenty more to learn but i wanted to start there if this video helped you at all please like 
share and subscribe to my channel as I'm trying to get this off the ground. I really would really appreciate your comments below and your support on my channel. So thanks for joining me and I hope to see you again in the next video.